welcome to the to the webinar uh, which we organize as part of the of the quantum project the quantifying migration scenarios for better policy initiative funded by the horizon 2020 the european commission so it's my great pleasure to, to to welcome everyone to this this webinar and we'll have a, a fantastic lineup of three three speakers three are team colleagues from from Quantmic, professors jürgen carling uh, matthias Schaik and marta Ivan Erdal. we'll be talking about translating migration theory into empirical propositions so for those of you who work in in the area of migration uh, Migration studies broadly understood. The, you know the, the speakers don't need much of an introduction, so I'll just say that, that Jürgen is a research professor at the Peace Research Institute, Oslo, working mostly in the area of migration and transnationalism, undocumented migration, as well as migration and development, where, where he leads a separate uh, Horizon 2020 project called MIGNEX. Uh, uh, Matthias is a professor in, in migration and integration and the head of Department of Migration and Globalization at the Danube University Krems in, in Austria and works on a range of topics, including, uh, including uh, drivers, globalization, decisions and, and policies. And Marta is a research professor also at the Peace Research Institute Oslo and uh, works in, an area, in, in areas such as migration, transnationalism, integration, as well as cultural and, and religious aspects and has uh, very extensive work, especially in South Asia. So I'm delighted to welcome you all. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to, to be able to see a sneak preview of, of one of our product, uh, one of our product, project outputs. Uh, the report underpinning this talk is available on our website, www.quote.eu. And without, without further ado, I will hand over to, to Jürgen to, to start the, the talk, just reminding everyone that if you have questions, uh, please pose them during the talk on the on the Q and A facility on, on Zoom. We'll pick them up and moderate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So now you should be seeing the uh, the presentation. Um, so this paper that um, Matthias and Marta and I wrote together is called Translating Migration Theory into empirical propositions. And first, I will say a little bit about um, what we mean by that, what kind of thinking is behind this title. Um, and then I will talk about the first three propositions that we've put out there. And um, Marta will follow with the next batch, and Matthias will take the last batch and also say something uh, to conclude at the end. So um, the QuantMIG project uh, is essentially a big machine that we are building in this consortium with the aim of quantifying migration scenarios for better policy. So trying to say something meaningful about what might happen in the future in terms of migration and how to relate to the uncertainties of, um, uh, of talking about and planning for migration in the future. Uh, and the idea is that this complex machinery will be fed with data. Um, and part of the data, or most of the data, is already existing in some form, but the machine itself is not. So now we are really in the process of building the machine. And this paper that we are presenting now is uh, part of that, is going to uh, contribute one little component into this machine that will eventually give us these um, better answers in terms of um, migration scenarios for, um, well, we say for better policy because it's, uh, that is indeed sort of the, the motivation behind this um, research funding. Um, but it is very much a project that um, speaks to those policy interests at the same time as really advancing our understanding of migration and thinking about migration. So see this paper uh, and several others in the early phases of the project as sort of the nuts and bolts that go into this bigger mission of the project. What is migration theory uh, that we take as a starting point for this paper? So the idea is that we uh, 
we all have a vague notion of what migration theory is, and we probably use it in different ways, but it is often not as explicit uh, in sort of the everyday work for those of us who do migration research as it is in um, textbooks and teaching on migration, where, for instance, many students would encounter theory chapters uh, that sort of account for theory one, theory two, theory three, as if there were distinct explanations for migration. Uh, or uh, some books and, and um, courses take more of a disciplinary approach, saying, for instance, that, well, migration is studied by historians, economists, political scientists, and they all have their different theories that they bring to the study of migration. And I don't think any of these two uh, descriptions really fit the way we use migration theory in uh, migration research today. Um, yes, we all come with our disciplinary backgrounds, and yes, there are different approaches, but there are not sort of neat compartments in the way that this slide suggests. The reality looks more like this, different elements of theoretical thought. Um, and it's all influenced very much by disciplinary background, by our methodological preferences, uh, by our interests. Um, for instance, coming to the study of migration with a specific interest in policy also does something with the theoretical perspectives that we apply. And um, perspectives also in terms of whether we, we are talking and researching from a country of origin perspective or a country of destination perspective, and indeed which region of the world. Um, and although migration theory is supposedly sort of at an abstract level beyond the specifics of different contexts, we know that all theory comes out of specific geographical contexts and is often colored by that. Um, and we, in this project, we do build on work that's been conducted in, in Europe, uh, much of it, and we talk uh, to a policy interest that's linked to migration to Europe. Um, but uh, we, take, we take a broader view in the sense that explanations for that migration also lies elsewhere and that many of the questions we want to address ought to be addressed um, in a way that isn't so colored by um, the regional origins of the authors. So in this kind of mixed landscape, how do we then take this step from migration theory to empirical research? because much of the theory that's out there is not um, really in the form of um, falsifiable theoretical statements, but rather um, suggestions for how we might approach explanations. And the explanations that we seek uh, when we talk about migration theory in this paper are aspects of migration, such as why does migration occur? who migrates and who stays, what are the spatial and temporal patterns of migration, and how does migration self-perpetuate? Those are sort of the migration elements of migration theory. Um, and as you will see, uh, we're not going into basically everything that happens after migration in the sense of um, integration processes, sustained transnational practices, and so on. So migration theory and the narrow sense of explaining migration itself. Now, the theory part of it um, is actually quite diverse. Um, there are elements of migration theory that are theories in the narrow sense of um, statements about uh, the world that can directly um, be formulated into predictions about what should happen under specific circumstances, and which can then also be confronted with empirical uh, evidence and perhaps rejected. Um, but a lot of the theoretical um, work that's out there in migration studies is not of such a nature that the theory itself can be rejected. Um, so just to take one example, the transnational turn in the study of migration has been hugely important in, in theory and transnational perspectives open up for different ways of seeing and understanding and interpreting migration, but it's not fruitful to sort of set out to, to prove or disprove uh, transnationalism as a 
as a theory. That's not what it's about. It's an enlightening theoretical contribution. And uh, that type of contribution, as well as the more sort of traditional um, falsifiable theories, can be used as foundations for um, empirical propositions or propositions for empirical research. So that's what we're doing in this paper. We've picked out 10 areas where we think that on the basis of this relatively uh, fragmented and messy field of living migration theory, we can say something about what we expect to be the case empirically. Um, some of these propositions we are quite convinced are true. Um, others are indeed very much open to debate and open to empirical confrontation, some of which will take part in the context of quantum mechanics. So the propositions are indeed uh, inspired by these four questions that have to do with migration and open to different types of theory. Here's the first one. Emigration rises with economic development until a certain level and thereafter falls. So this is um, uh, a statement, a proposition that is uh, of an empirical nature so that you can, it describes what we uh, may see or not out there in the real world. Um, and it's a nice one to start with because it's one of the, one of the relatively few that is so clear and has really been the subject of empirically based uh, debate and disagreement in migration research in recent years. Sometimes this, uh, this proposition is referred to as the migration hump because of the shape of the curve. It rises and then it falls. Um, and the, the short version of it is that um, for most countries of the world where the income level is not yet at this certain level, more development, economic development, means more migration. And that's um, counterintuitive in the sense that you would expect that when people's lives get better, they get less inclined to leave and seek a better life elsewhere. But then theory tells us that there are many good reasons why uh, the opposite is true, that when people's lives improve, their aspirations improve uh, or rise even more in the sense that their sense of what is a reasonable standard of living, for instance, rises more quickly than their actual standard of living. And their awareness of the possibilities that exist elsewhere also rise more quickly with the consequence that more people actually leave. Uh, it's also a policy relevant uh, proposition in the sense that um, policymakers are uh, debating how to approach the problem of um, migration that is unwanted by the destination countries and sought to be reduced by the destination countries. Um, those policy implications raise a lot of, of um, political and ethical issues that we don't go into here, but um, which are very closely connected to this, um, to this proposition. It's also a very uh, apparently an easily testable one. Um, but uh, since there are so many ways of going about it, it's not quite that simple. It um, has been uh, confirmed very emphatically and convincingly uh, in recent research, primarily by Michael Clemens, who has this nice empirical figure that sort of mirrors the theoretical model, um, but which I think also illustrates the complexity of trying to arrive at a simple yes or no um, in response to this proposition. Because development can be approached in a much broader sense than just economic development, what are the implications of doing that? And there are different scales of analysis, time scales, regional scales. Um, how is this different when we look at individuals whose lives improve, whereas when we look at countries where the average is improved, for instance. The next proposition uh, is that migrants, the people who actually have left their country of birth, are outnumbered by involuntary non-migrants, which are the people who would like to move but are still in their country of origin, very often because immigration restrictions prevent them from going. So this is founded on the on the what I've worked on um, for many years about the separation of 
aspirations to migrate and the ability to do so. And that many people have only the aspiration and not the ability. So the best numbers that exist today suggest that just over 3% of the global population are migrants. And another 15% say that they would actually prefer to move permanently to another country um, if they had the opportunity, but they don't. And then the remaining 82% are people who are happy to remain where they are. This has some important implications for uh, migration processes, for migration policy, for what determines the actual migration flows that we observe and how that might be possible to affect through policy. But it also raises big challenges in terms of both theory and methods. How do we conceptualize this desire to, to move elsewhere? Um, and how do we measure it? That's something that I'm that we are working on in sort of other constellations within the Quantbank project, and there will be more papers on that in the months to come. And also something that I'm personally working on in two other projects, MakeMix and Fumi. The last proposition that I will talk about is that development aid can deter immigration from low and middle income countries. Now, this seems like the uh, like the perfect opposite of the one that I started with, which was basically that more development means more migration. Uh, because if development aid can mean less migration, that's apparently a contradiction. Uh, and to some extent, this proposition does challenge the migration hub. But um, it's worth asking, uh, under what conditions might this still be true? what forms of development aid could deter immigration from low and middle income countries? And maybe part of the answer lies in the difference between economic development in a narrow sense and broader um, aspects of development. So for instance, we know, that, uh, we know that corruption is quite a powerful driver of migration. We know that um, poor uh, public services um, can inspire migration. Um, so maybe if those particular aspects of development are addressed through aid in a more targeted way, that would have other impacts on migration aspirations overall than sort of general economic development. Um, and then, of course, we have to ask, would those be effects on, on aspirations or on the ability to migrate? Because um, when there is less corruption, perhaps it means that more people have faith in creating a local future. Um, but when they do get richer, that also has the effect of increasing their ability to migrate, uh, perhaps because they can afford to, to pay the costs or that they have uh, more skills that they can uh, use after migration. This also has very uh, challenging policy implications to deal with, because if this is the case, what should be the uh, the consequences for aid policy. Um, and there's, there are lots of discussions to have about the political and ethical implications of it. But at the moment, those debates are ongoing without real certainty about these two um, relevant propositions. And for instance, we do see aid shifting towards countries from which many undocumented migrants to Europe uh, originate without really knowing if that shift, that geographical shift in aid uh, does anything meaningful about migration, or if it does something um, more or less for development than it did in the regions where it was originally um, deployed. Then I leave uh, my first three propositions there and hand over to uh, Marta for the next ones. Thanks, Eugen. Do you want to just move to the next slide? Thanks. So the first proposition I'm going to speak about is this one. Migration flows often reflect pre-existing connections between countries. Uh, and so this is a proposition which is also, of course, then anchored in a lot of the literature. Uh, and if you're interested in the references, then I'd like to refer you to the background paper that's available on the website, as, as Jakob mentioned. I think this... Um, Proposition merits more attention in a way, and it resonates with debates that are ongoing in, in migration studies, 
in terms of the need to focus also beyond migrants specifically. I think that's an important backdrop to this proposition. Uh, next again. Thanks. So the basic idea here is uh, that migration flows reflect other types of connections, uh, often in the past, that are important to include in the analysis. And such connections could then be related to trade uh, and to linguistic connections. Um, these linguistic connections could perhaps be linked also to the fact that countries are close to each other uh, and that many borders are actually not so old. So specifically thinking about the European context, we know that there has been a huge amount of border movement within the European continent uh, within the past century. This is, of course, not limited to Europe, right? We know about the colonial history, uh, not least in Africa. So again, with a lot of different borders moving around, uh, as well as people moving around, which is also important to context and for trying to understand the patterns uh, of contemporary migration and how those can be traced to different types of pre-existing connections between countries uh, in the past. There are also some, some important aspects that have to do with um, uh, trade, perhaps also historically. And if, also, again, then if we look beyond the European context, there are interesting Chinese examples. I'm sure there are interesting Chinese examples also in the very contemporary context. But thinking a little bit uh, into the past, actually, as well, there's a lot of examples of sort of Chinese trade historically uh, being directly traceable then to the movements of people uh, and where they settled. And so then understanding the migration patterns without seeing those trade connections doesn't really make much sense. And I think there are some clear uh, connections also to things that are going on today uh, in that context as well. And there's also uh, an aspect here that has to do with sort of uh, connecting these different things that have to do with migration patterns and, and completely other aspects of connections between countries that might have to do with trade, but also with other things. Uh, that is quite well covered. I think also thinking about this through the term uh, human geopolitics, which Alan Gamlin has written about. Uh, so really thinking perhaps through the example then of diaspora strategies, which doesn't have to be only that, in terms of how uh, different types of connections are important to understand these uh, migration patterns. Uh, and so here it's important to, to focus methodologically not only on uh, remembering uh, that the present is very much shaped by the past, which I think in migration studies we we very often forget that there's a past and there's a past beyond the last two decades even that we need to be thinking about to understand what's going on. Um, but also again, this, uh, this call to focus not just on migrants in migration studies. Next one, please. The second proposition I wanted to discuss um, is the one which we've labeled migration flows beyond a certain threshold become self-sustaining. And as Jürgen mentioned, this is kind of a, a key idea in, in a sense in migration studies as well. Next, please. So here we have a, a number of, of terms that have been very much discussed in migration studies, both at the theoretical level and certainly at the empirical level. I think there are sort of uh, core cases that everyone in migration studies knows in terms of um, these ideas of chain migration and social networks and not least uh, migration from Mexico to the US would be mentioned very often there. I think very often we'd also refer to, to the case of migration from Turkey to Germany, also as examples of kind of chain migration and the roles of so social networks in indeed in then um, making migration uh, self-sustaining, at least above a certain threshold. Um, I think here it's important also to think about the ways in which perhaps different types um, uh, of migration corridors and different ways of approaching pioneers uh, may also matter and, and affect how we understand this. Uh, there are different ways of approaching this in, in terms of different cases. Uh, and I think this is a, a, an empirical proposition where it would be interesting to really think creatively about which kinds of ideas we might have uh, in terms of, of testing it. And also perhaps how ideas about which, which types of migrants we are thinking of. Is it lab labor migration that we assume is male, for instance, that is dominating our theorization here? Are we thinking about female labor migrants to the same extent here or, or not uh, is important to discuss. I think also there are important um, cases of post-EU accession migration here, which uh, are probably very useful to think of here. And perhaps uh, as very relevant in the UK context right now, what, what about Brexit in this context uh, in terms of, uh, you know, threshold up to a certain level or a certain time or in, uh, in certain circumstances, but what happens next then? Does that migration then stop? Do people return? Uh, what, what's going to happen next? I think there's some interesting research that could be done there as well. 
And here, of course, uh, institutions and networks matter a lot. Uh, and there's been a lot of interesting work recently on migration industries, migration infrastructures, and again, kind of thinking maybe beyond the migrants and the migrant social networks also in terms of how these migration flows beyond a certain threshold become self-sustaining or not and for how long. Next, please. Thanks. So the third proposition that I wanted to speak about uh, is the one we've labeled migrants with fewer resources make more fragmented, convoluted and unpredictable journeys. Next, please. I think this is a proposition where there's a lot of uh, emerging work, and I think there's a lot of kind of disconnected work uh, in terms of different cases as well, which makes it quite exciting to, to put forward as a proposition. And perhaps in the comments and questions section, there might be ideas about how to follow up on this or whether people uh, agree that it actually makes sense as a proposition as well, which would be in interesting to hear about. So this question, uh, this proposition really speaks to this um, need not only to focus on why people migrate, and where they migrate, but actually how? How does this migration come about? How is it possible or, or impossible? So let's say a step, a step beyond from what Jürgen was speaking about, people who have aspirations but can't move, uh, to the ones who maybe have aspirations and, and are able to move to some extent, uh, but they have to actually split up their journey in different parts to actually uh, be able to, to move it all, rather than thinking of moving to specific destinations straight away. Uh, so one of the inspirations for this empir empirical proposition is uh, Nick Van Heer's paper titled I went as far as my money would take me, which I think in a way uh, summarizes it quite well. Uh, and I think also here it's, it's interesting to think about different types of migration drivers and journey fragmentation. Uh, and perhaps also suggest suggesting that uh, while we might uh, see that migration drivers can be quite different, for instance, in relation to the rules of conflict or, or climate change, or more sort of economic hopelessness as different types of drivers, uh, probably in terms of the ways and the nature in which journeys are fragmented, which kinds of drivers are the most salient for particular migrants are not so significant. So I think it's an interesting area also to, to look at from that uh, perspective to see in, how far it holds and for whom and when, I guess. Um, also interesting examples to draw on here, which perhaps we, we don't necessarily mix or combine so much, especially not in theorization in migration studies, uh, are student migrants. So in terms of thinking about resources and complex migration trajectories, uh, student migration as a sort of huge migration flow that very often is studied separately is interesting to think about. And the ways in which uh, access to student programs for students from very different origin countries uh, leads perhaps to uh, a migration trajectory, which maybe starts with a student program and then maybe eight ends with something completely different, perhaps in a completely different location. So I think that's an, an interesting opportunity perhaps to pursue to be able to test this as well. But also perhaps thinking in terms of internal migration and thinking about both men and women migrating internally, perhaps from rural to urban areas as well as uh, in terms of these fragmented journeys that might end up becoming international migration, although they don't have to, they could be fragmented internal journeys um, as well. So here the resources and accessible migration pathways are actually a sort of key word as well. And I think, again, that connects very well to very policy relevant discussions that are being had at the moment as well in terms of what accessible migration pathways are there actually and which types of resources do people have to be able to have to access those pathways so for whom are they, they accessible in a sense thanks i'll pass on to matthias then Matthias, I think you might be on mute. Oh, yes. Sorry. All right. Thank you. I, um, so it's my, my, my pleasure now to present uh, the four remaining propositions um, out of the ten. Two of uh, them uh, addressing key areas of uh, more recent policy interest, uh, environmental uh, migration and conflict-induced migration, and the other two propositions uh, rather referring to the role of migration policies. So let me start with the first one, environmentally induced migration. It is by now a stylist fact that climate change and environmental degradation has multiple uh, implication on people's livelihoods. Um, environmental change um, and its multi-dimensional manifestations uh, causes stressful um, situations for a growing population uh, around the globe, um, affecting people's necessity, their willingness and their ability 
to migrate. But what we find um, by uh, reading the literature is also that um, climate change is mostly a predisposing driver that affects migration rather indirectly through, for example, channels like um, uh, economic implications, for example, in terms of agricultural productivities and incomes or more broader livelihood opportunities, um, rather than directly. Um, what we also find is that environmental stress affects the poorest most severely, um, and that increases actually their ability to move. Um, what we find is that migration as an adaptation strategy is therefore not available for a growing population uh, that is trapped in vulnerable uh, situations. And that refers to uh, actually the, uh, the proposition that uh, Jorgen has uh, uh, referred to, actually this growing uh, um, number of people that are involuntary in mobile. So what we find basically as part of this proposition that emphasizes uh, the separation of a population into a trapped part and to, into a mobilized uh, uh, part uh, as a kind of a bifurcation of mobility patterns. So part of, um, uh, of those affected by environmental degradation are trapped into such vulnerable situations, whereas another uh, um, part or fraction of these uh, vulnerable populations is actually able to move um, either internally or internationally. Next one, please. The second proposition refers to um, violence and uh, violations of uh, human rights and conflicts in, in a broader sense, which is uh, um, known as uh, key drivers of involuntary migration. Uh, what we um, presume in this uh, proposition is that um, these factors trigger uh, people's um, aspirations to, to, to leave conflict affected areas. Um, but not, in, uh, not immediately, but rather uh, once a certain insecurity um, or risk for life uh, level is surpassed, uh, kind of a tolerance level. And then uh, when a certain uh, kind of conflict uh, intensity uh, uh, you know, triggers a, a tipping point, then larger scale uh, emigration processes are induced and emigration turns into a sort of survival strategy. However, not all forms of violent conflict uh, trigger large-scale uh, displacements. Uh, and here we can uh, look into more recent uh, uh, conflicts, uh, like in Syria, Eritrea, um, uh, and other places, where conflicts have triggered very different types and forms, and in particular intensities of out-migration. Displacement patterns are the result, what we find, uh, of a complex mix of conflict exposure, risk perceptions, individual risk perceptions, and people's uh, resource endowments that would basically enable them or uh, disable them uh, to leave a conflict in con uh, context. What's also relevant here is to emphasize that conflict um, not only trigger out migration directly, but also through their indirect uh, effects on um, on resources, on livelihoods, on in public infrastructure, and other factors that might indirectly trigger out migration propensities and actual behavior. What's also relevant to mention here as part of this proposition is um, that um, most conflict induced migration is rather short distance um, and only develops into longer distance moves for parts of those who have moved initially. Uh, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the longer term. So secondary movements, onward migration, after having um, moved to a first place of security, protection, or asylum, whatever um, um, you may call it, um, are um, then more long, longer distance, are more economically motivated um, um, compared to the initial survival moves. Next one, please. So let me come to the last two propositions that refer uh, to the role of migration policies. The first one is migration policies are largely ineffective in producing desired outcomes. I mean, this is a proposition that the policymakers probably don't like that much. Uh, and I think also the migration research community is not really contesting that migration policy has some effects. 
However, uh, what the literature finds so far that policies restrictions and policy incentives, so not only deterrence policies, but also attracting uh, and recruitment policies, for example, create opportunity structures. But how these opportunity structures actually shape the volume and the composition and the dynamic and the direction, and also in the end, the legality of flows, um, that's still rather contested. And uh, the empirical um, evidence on those questions is relatively thin so far. Why? Mostly for methodological reasons. It refers a lot to the definition of migration policy. Um, the question whether what type of my policy, migration policy is investigated, whether a very specific sector policy or broader policy regimes, um, but also refer, uh, with regard to the operationalization of migration policies. So there, uh, uh, a lot of more conceptual work has to be done. When it comes to the actual effects of migration policies, um, uh, the effectiveness depends a lot on how we measure policy outcomes and migration outcomes in the longitudinal perspective. So uh, taking into account time lags, um, for example, but also taking into account feedback uh, effects of uh, migration outcomes on policy uh, making um, is, is ob obviously um, a methodological challenge in, in this specific area. And uh, lastly, um, migration policies are obviously a, uh, just one element in a broader immigration package and a part of a broader driver complex. Next, please. So the last proposition uh, is linked to the previous one, and it says migration restrictions affect migration flows in unintended ways. Um, migration policy interventions often, not always, but often produce politically and ethically unwanted migration outcomes. Um, this can be called policy externalities or side effects, um, and these side effects often limit um, or obscure the realization of migration policy objectives. What are these side effects? We we know, and there is uh, there's research on this, and uh, some conceptualization also of my uh, former colleague Heinde Haas, um, referring to spatial diversion, so spatial deflection effects, so migrants moving to other destinations once a destination becomes more restrictive, for example, um, or the categorical deflection, so migrants changing legal categories um, um, as a response to um, uh, changing migration policies in, on a particular uh, uh, type of migration. There are temporal shifts, so migrants can pre or postpone their move as a response to changing migration policies. And of course, uh, also the question, how do policy asymmetries uh, affect migration uh, flow? So it's, it's, it's hypothesized that uh, policy changes in, in different directions do not create uh, you know, some, some of similar effects. Um, and also the question whether there is some hysteresis, uh, which means accumulating policy effects over time. These are aspects that are largely uh, um, affecting you know, the, 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 the effectiveness of policy, but also the measurement of, of migration policy effects. So, and, and last point here, again, migration policies are mediated by intervening third factor. So again, this refers to the, the complexity, the driver complexity of which migration policies are one part of. To conclude, next slide, please. Um, in absence of a grand theory that I think is not there, what, what's there is a, a, a kind of a very fragmented landscape of migration theories and concepts. Um, a triangulation of these fragmented migration theories allows the formulation of propositions, and we have to do it in order to test and to verify, uh, but also in particular to falsify existing concepts and, 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 and theories. So a proposition and its underlying theoretical concepts are only tentatively valid, basically until better theories are available or have been uh, some sort of uh, have been refined in some ways. Theoretically and empirically triangulated cons uh, and consolidated propositions are useful for ex post evaluations. I think that's uh, very clear. Uh, um, we have to refer to migration theories, and we can refer to migration theories in order to make sense about historical 
uh, migration patterns, movements, and, and dynamics. But what's also or equally relevant for, in particular for the quantum project is the future of migration. And I think also here, migration theory is relevant and we can refer to and should refer to in order to um, um, uh, come up with testable propositions in order to uh, inform the modeling of, 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 uh, of projections and in order, to, um, in, uh, in order to reduce the epistemic uncertainty uh, with regard to the future of migration. With this, we will leave it uh, uh, for the uh, Q&A uh, discussion now. We thank you for your attention and your interest in this webinar. Um, the paper, as it was mentioned, uh, can be uh, downloaded on the Quantmic website, and we're happy for any feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to, to all three of you, Jürgen, Marta, and, and Matthias. For, for taking us through the what, what was you know, quite a quite a large body of work on on how to turn the theoretical the theoretical advancement in migrate in the field of migration into empirically testable propositions we've got we've got, I got actually got quite a few questions so so I'll, I'll go through them in the order in which they were they were uh, posted starting from starting from the uh, the one let me just because the, 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 some of them appeared on the chat window and some of them appeared on the on the Q and A, right? So the, the first question chronologically was from from York Worms to 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 everyone. Do you cover the question of return migration and reintegration? Was the are there are any propositions particularly linked to these phenomena? These Was, I, th I think it was it was uh, it was asked during Jürgen's Jürgen's part of the of the talk. I, I may I may pick up, pick up on you, Jürgen. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> we of course we we faced the difficult challenge in picking out uh, some and some propositions, uh, and these ten are obviously not the only ten that we could have formulated. So I would say that yes, also in those areas. Uh, there are uh, there is potential for formulating propositions like the ones that we have, and I mean uh, the laws of migration that um, uh, Ravenstein uh, published in was it 1885 includes one specifically about return migration, which is the, that the, every migration flow produces a, a counterflow of re of returnees, and I think that's. Uh, Still true, and we could probably develop um, develop uh, more specific ones today. Um, one that I that Marta and I have both been interested in, which I think is important, is that uh, uh, return visits uh, are an important um, uh, impetus for for return migration, that there's a clear empirical relationship there that also has a lot to do with, with, the, with the processes at work. So, I mean, that's quite a, at quite a specific level, um, but uh, yeah, in short, we could have picked other ones and it's uh, certainly possible to pursue the same um, approach also in, in terms of return and, and possibly mm -hmm. circulation. I, th I think I think I, I I I can add from the from the general project point of view that you know in in the project per se I mean broadly we will be looking at all directions of flows so into the focus is on Europe but but we'll we'll be looking at, at flows into out of and within Europe so between European countries without without uh, putting more emphasis on one 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 flow versus versus the other so 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 in a sense that at the empirical level at the scenario setting level the return flows or the counter flows will get exactly the same level of prominence it's just the as as, you, as Jürgen has said the the, the the choice of the empirically testable uh, propositions linking to the existing theories was uh, was what was driving the the selection that you have been uh, hearing today there was if another I may, question if I may, if I may yeah, add I think also the, the proposition with the fragmented journeys has a very uh, unclear boundary to uh, 
return mobilities, right? And I think it's a definitional issue as well. You know, when, when does a migration journey stop, right? Is it a, a perpetual process? Are people just mobile forever? Do they settle down? And do they settle down for how long? We know if you ask people, you know, are you never going to return ever, ever? Very few people say, I'm never going to return ever, ever. So <laughs> I think it's also a bit of a definitional question there in that sense. But I also agree there are many, uh, many empirical propositions that could be developed, I think, specifically relating to return and return mobilities. And I think it might be interesting to think about propositions that tackle integration and reintegration, perhaps in similar ways as well, because we know there are many similarities uh, that connect how people experience integration in, in the first, second or third country uh, that they travel to uh, and how they might experience reintegration in a country of origin after a long time as well. So I think it's a, it's a good question and, and probably other people here could pick up that challenge as well. And I mean, we, we had a quick, quick technical question to, to, to Jürgen, which was already answered about uh, the asp quantifying aspirations for migration, which you answered on the Q&A. Uh, find that, that we do that by looking at the Gallup world, world poll figures, and that's, a, that's, a, that's exactly the source. That suggested. So linking to the return migration, there was a, there was a question about, uh, about the, is the framework for returning sex differences in the types of migration and with specifically with referring to Ravenstein's laws and, and Ravenstein's laws also do, do imply counterflows and do look in, uh, into uh, return migration. So uh, the, the, the question was whether, whether this, the Ravenstein's view has been updated or enriched. And, and I mean, before, before handing over to, to Marta, who, 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 who this, this, this question was directed, may I just say that, you know, that, that there's, there's been a, a nice paper published by Phil Rees and Nick Lomax earlier this year in uh, comparative population studies, where, where they actually revisit Ravenstein, uh, Ravenstein's theory, you know, 145 years uh, or whatever it is later, uh, and, and do a retrospective on that. So feel, feel free to but I'll, I'll hand over to Marta to comment on that, on that spe specifically on the sex differences in the types of migration. I guess I can try and at least comment on that. I think the, the question whether we need uh, sort of new theorization after Amenstein, I think is very pertinent, but th thankfully we do have some of that, right? So I think that a lot of work has been done and a lot of work has been done also on, on female migration specifically, on male migration specifically, on other gender dimensions of, of migration. But I do think there's, there's a need to sort of push how we think about theorization further, building on those other empirical examples that we have. So when we talk about labor migration, which kinds of images does that sort of conjure in our minds? Do we think about nurses or do we think about construction workers? Uh, and I think there's, you know, there's, there's always more work to do there, I think also at the theoretical level. Uh, and I think probably uh, it's important there to also make sure that that's not, all, not also all based on European experiences or North American experiences, which is a continuous problem, I think. And I think rather than then sort of uh, reverting to our regional hubs, we should try and connect and see how we can build theorization that hopefully can be uh, shedding light on and helping explain things that go on in very different contexts. I think that should be the ultimate test of whether it's good theorization or, or a bit poor. Yeah, so uh, there was a the, the, thanks for that. And there was a later question, you know, is, is the is the project or is your work specifically about about the south to north migration? So I hope we've we've answered that. I mean it's it's, it's I mean it takes a European focus, but but it looks at, at at all different different directions and different modes. Then then we had a comment from, from Rainer Mintz about uh, actually again to, to Marta's part to the, the one about migration flows becoming self-sustained. So, so, so Reiner commented that his guess is that the migration regime is also what influences the degree to which migration flow become self-sustained. So, so I, you know, I guess that the, 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 the legal framework and, and everything that comes with it. Can you, Marta, can you perhaps comment a, a bit on that? Yes, uh, I think it's a good question. I guess Matthias and Egan might want to add as well. Um, well, yes, of course, I think it does. Uh, at the same time, I think there are a couple of other questions also that I noticed that, you know, they refer to, um, you know, illegal migration. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we need to question also how we refer to these things. So what is it that makes migration illegal, right? Uh, that would be the regimes, not the migrants, surely. Um, so I think there's something about how we approach this analytically as well in terms of uh, what we think is, is the most significant. But, but yes, of course, the ways in which states manage their borders and which types of programs there are uh, 
for people to get uh, work permits, etc. Those things we know uh, are going to be super important. And again, bringing up the EU post-EU accession migration, I think, is a really good example of, of actually seeing how that plays out. And we see that in many other places as well, including actually in terms of migration from third countries to European Union countries, uh, which is not necessarily promoted. <laughs> but for instance, in terms of, of Poland, which receives a huge number of engineers from India every year, also in recent years, which is not uh, you know, publicly discussed so much necessarily. Uh, but that shows how regimes really, really matter and can maybe shape flows uh, in very different types, uh, types of ways, I think. Mm -hmm. Thanks, and, and in a sense that that, that, that that speaks to globalization as well. And you know, we had a comment from from Omran about you know an example of France and North Africa being very relevant, colonial links and 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 proximity and language ties and and everything else. And it, it plays nicely to, to the you know both the world systems theory and and the, 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 the migration systems theory. But but there is there, there is the point that you made, Marta, that that these things are dynamic and they they they, they also change, and you can have policy regime shaping uh, shaping quite a lot of the flow. Um, there was there was another question, I think that it was already to Matthias's part uh, from Sarah Johnson. Do you have ideas about which, which data sources can be used for the proposition that environmental stress creates bifurcation in mobility path? How can we test it? I, I mean, a lot of research that is uh, currently going on um, um, across various projects um, obviously uh, focuses a lot on, on, on the micro level on, on using survey data um, smaller scale surveys but also large scale surveys surveys um, I mean um, you were referring to the micnex project uh, yet Jürgen Kaling is is, is, is leading here, for example, we, we collect uh, um, micro level data, but also uh, data at, 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 uh, at the regional level um, in order to address, for example, the role of environmental change um, on, on, on out migration. But other data sources um, obviously are more aggregate data. Uh, there's research uh, using macro level data um, um, at the regional or even at the country level um, that tries to address um, and, and identify uh, the, the role environmental change um, in its various manifestations and operationalizations uh, drive and trigger um, out migration. I only refer here to work by Michelle Bain and, and, and Chris Parsons, for example. Thanks. And and that there was that there was a question to, to, to all of all of you or all of us really. How how can we account for for undocumented migration in empirical testing of positions and the known problems with measurement? I can maybe start there, and I think that's something we maybe uh, could highlight even more, um, which has been important in working with this paper. Uh, in that we've really tried to engage with both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, studies or studies based on those types of data and I think you know obviously there's uh, a lot more that qualitative studies can offer in terms of actually doing research with undocumented migrants uh, which is hard to capture in official registers right so I think uh, there's also sort of uh, some value added of trying to combine insights from qualitative work perhaps especially there uh, which I think um, yeah, maybe it's something we can take <laughs> take into other discussions as well, where there are some gains to be had, I think, uh, from those things uh, as well. Thanks. And and for, for, for Matthias, can you give an example of a triangulation approach? <laughs> how would you triangulate? What what would you triangulate and how? Yeah, I, I mean, we, we, we propose here basically both a, a theoretical triangulation as well as an empirical triangulation. So theoretical uh, triangulation obviously uh, refers to the combination of complementary concepts and ideas uh, in order to refer uh, to, to explain a, a certain migration phenomenon, right? Um, so usually since many migration theories, if not all migration theories are very contextual, um, they're not generally valid, but they are, have to be context they have to be contextualized, um, and and they're also limited um, in in the way they they uh, a particular migration theory can explain a, a certain phenomenon. Therefore, um, um, you know, various uh, research, for example, I refer to work by Felix Garib, for example, um, um, 
uses several migration theories and concepts in order to explain a certain migration uh, phenomenon because uh, whether these neoclassical uh, uh, theories referring more to economic uh, motivated migration or whether it's, it's more uh, the, the group level uh, uh, that is relevant in the migration uh, decision-making process referring to new, uh, uh, new economics of labor migration combined for example with, with network theories um, obviously all those uh, theories have to be combined in order to explain broader migration patterns and dynamics and i, I think that, that, that there's a there's a very there's a very interesting follow-up question from from elspeth you know interesting proposition but could you help clarify how they relate to migration theory do you think that there could ever be uh, a single overarching integrative migration theory or is context important context in terms of time and space i guess it's a it's a it's a general question i think we all have views on whether there, there may be a migration theory a grant migration theory or not like not to hear your views here again yes and uh, i mean that's i think that's the sort of core challenge of this exercise that you know this is this is not natural science. We can't expect there to be universally applicable laws of how these things work. So um, the propositions do describe uh, empirical realities that are shaped by, by context, but context at a fairly general level. So several people asked about, you know, is this only about migration into Europe from the outside? And, I think we've sort of been inspired by that perspective, but still aimed to make it more general than than that. Um, but it's it's difficult to strike the right balance between saying you know this is always true, which is not so helpful, or saying this is always context specific, which is also not so helpful. Um, so I think uh, we that's where we. Uh, stand struggling with this um, balancing act of saying something that is um, both general and and interesting and there was there was one actually comment or suggestion which for which we we, we thank which was to possibly think of clustering the propositions into micro meso and, and, and macro level ones which i think is, is is something worth worth looking into uh, I'm conscious of the time, so, so I, I, I really apologize that we won't be able to go through all the all the questions, but we can we can stay uh, stay online for a moment after after the webinar finishes uh, and to, to try to answer them through the uh, through the chat box. The, 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 I, one question I wanted to pick up on because it, it links to the work that we have still planned. How how can you work with National Statistical Institute on how to better develop estimates and quantify the types of migration you have mentioned? Actually, this is this is this is planned within the project, so so we we will be providing uh, as part of our output harmonized estimates of uh, within European and uh, migration as as well as migration in, into and out of Europe from the main regions of origin and, and, and destination. Uh, this is this is sort of in a, in a longer horizon, but but we do have uh, plans to develop a, a, a statistical model that that actually takes data from the so I think with that, because we've, we've already, it's already past two o'clock in, in, in Britain, three o'clock uh, in continental Europe. So I hand, I'll hand over to, to Daniela, just saying thank you very much for, for all the questions and, uh, and, and comments. I apologize that we didn't manage to answer all of them, but this just shows how, how you know, how, how fascinating the topic is and how important these Changes. Uh, I'll, I'll hand over back to, to Daniela for, for the final. I just want to thank you everyone for being here with us. It has been a very productive webinar. And uh, if you would like to keep in touch with us, we are on Twitter and uh, there we update everything that's going on on the project. You can also follow our, our news on the website, quantmeet.eu. The Twitter is quantmeet, just like that. Uh, yeah, and hope. See you again in our future webinar.